I would like to welcome you to today's expert online session. Today we're going to be talking about evidence-based hearing preservation with deep electrode insertion and its future. I'm excited, I'm very excited to have two experts on hearing preservation with flex electrodes with me. I am uh, Dr. Marek Polak. Since 2008, I am responsible for EAS and hearing preservation within METAL, and I'm also head of the electrophysiology at the METAL. Before we continue, I'm going to start with housekeeping. First of all, uh, please, if you haven't done that yet, please name yourself uh, with name, organization, country. Uh, the way how to do it, you click on your name in the participants panel, click on more, and then you can rename it. To avoid background noise, please mute your microphone if you don't speak and mute also your phone. For stable internet connection on your side, we recommend to close all your other programs on your device. This is an inter interactive session and we are here to hear from you and we have here two expert surgeons. If you have any questions, please drop them down in the chat and we will get to them at the end of the session. I'm happy to say that there is an English captioning. Uh, to have this feature available, uh, please click on closed captioning and it's going to be a little more, e more, more easier for you to follow up. Now I would like to introduce our two expert surgeons. I have here with me Professor Piotr Skarsinski from Institute of Physiology and Pathology of Hearing in Warsaw and World Hearing Center in Kaitani. Uh, Professor uh, Piotr Skarsinski at his uh, young age has already published numerous peer-reviewed papers and became an expert in uh, hearing preservation already. Uh, the, the second speaker I have here is Professor Gunesh Rajan, who is a co-chief ENT, at the ENT clinic at LUKS in Luzern, in Switzerland, and Professor of Otolaryngology, had an ex surgery at the University of Western Australia in Perth. Uh, Professor Gunesh Rajan is a is a, a hearing preservation enthusiast. Uh, since uh, 2005, uh, he uh, constantly started to work on the hearing preservation topics and published numerous papers uh, in uh, in his career. Now, uh, today we talk about the hearing preservation and and uh, how beneficial may be hearing preservation with deep insertion in uh, EAS and partial deafness patients. The takeaway I would like you to have is how these techniques can fit in your practice. Uh, now we're going to go to Mentimeter. Please take out your code. You can see it on the screen. Go to Mentimeter.com or just scan the QR code. And we're going to go to first question. Uh, there are going to be two questions. Uh, please answer them. The first question is, what are the benefits of hearing preservation with long electrodes? Let's give it some more time to put in your answers. Good tonotopic coverage. Very good answer.
quality sound quality tonotopic organization contact spacing outcomes So far, the most answers were good coverage, stimulation on low frequencies, very good answer, future proofing, good. I think I think we got a sufficient number of uh, of answers. Uh, this is going to be covered in the talk by uh, Professor Skarsinski. You're gonna, hear, you're gonna hear more on this. And now we can move to second question. The second question is, what is the optimal insertion speed with flex electrodes? Now let's give it some time to answer questions for you. slow we have three minutes very slow one minute per contact super slow as slow as possible All right, I think we can move on. Uh, the, uh, the more answers on this topic, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Professor Gunesh Rajan, who is going to cover uh, uh, most important uh, uh, the features uh, during the, for the, uh, from the surgical uh, point of view. Uh, before giving a, a uh, space to Professor Skarsinski, I would like to show you two more slides. Uh, just recently, there was a published uh, book uh, by uh, Professor uh, Dr. Uh, Hochmeier, 30 years of translational research behind the medal. And one of the chapters is on EAS combined electric and acoustic stimulation. Uh, there is also a link uh, where you can uh, see it on this slide and I would encourage you to, to look on it. That is a very nice overview on what happened on the, on the EAS, uh, when it happened and what was the rationale behind it. I have one more slide to show you. Uh, we have performed a systematic literature review to to compare hearing preservation rates in patients with uh, low frequency, a pure tone average better than 65, which is uh, uh, practically our EAS candidates, preoperatively between the longer electrodes, electrodes uh, either with flex 28 full insertion or flex soft with the insertion of 28 millimeters, 28 millimeters or more, and the shorter length electrodes, which included flex 24 electrodes with the uh, typical uh, classical EAS approach uh, with the, in order to reach 360 degree of insertion with the average, um, average insertion depth of 20 millimeters. Uh, we captured uh, over past 12 years uh, from all the peer-reviewed papers 33 studies in a, with total of 280 cases implanted with flex 24 and 77 cases with flex 28 or flex soft uh, on the graph you can see the outcomes for uh, patients implanted with 20 millimeters uh, at the four months follow-up there was 94 percent of hearing preservation at at one year of minimum of one year follow-up it was 94 person hearing preservation there was no drop found and if we look on the 28 millimeter insertion 
it was 91% at four months follow-up at and at 12 months follow-up there was a drop by 4% to 87%. Uh, therefore, we can uh, conclude based on this data that healing preservation is possible even with the 28 millimeter insertion with the flex electrodes. And now I would like to give a, a, a slot to Professor uh, Piotr uh, Skarsinski. Uh, Professor, please, uh, stage is yours whenever you are ready. Okay, <clears throat> I would like to thank you, Marek, for a very nice introduction, but I think in that moment, when we will talk in that friendly atmosphere about the hearing preservation, I think I would like also to thank Metal Company for at first good atmosphere and good attitude for the hearing preservation. When we look back, when I was even no students, it was end of 90s when the first trials were performed. And I remember my father who came after many conferences and a lot of specialists said, Henrik, what we are presenting, come on, what's that? It's no chance, it's uh, something against the law, etc. But he was a little bit stubborn and he did it. And so, you know, our first cases were from 97, 98. And when you look for other players like, like Kochlar, the first trial we did in 2009. So it was quite many years ago and the approach has changed a lot today. Almost everybody is talking about the standard that we need to preserve the structure, we need to preserve hearing, and it's a quite long story. And, uh, you know, I would like my lecture plan, I just looked, uh, who is the audience? So there are some surgeons, quite many audiologists and a lot of sympathies of the hearing preservation, but mainly I think Gunnar, you will agree with me, not uh, big, big surgeons who would like to do this. So I try to adjust my lecture for you. I will present my surgical strategy and the patient's approach results and some tips and tricks, which could be uh, good to know how we look uh, for the ear during the surgery. And uh, that's what is important. Uh, I presented it several times, uh, how the patients looked like in 2019, it was the last normal year that uh, the group of patients who are, you know, uh, I take the laser, laser will be maybe will be look green. The group of prelingual children decreased in ratio because at the beginning in general, they will did deaf children, sometimes prelingual adults, but it was the group which was focused. That group, which is perilingual, when we are not sure if the hearing is okay, hearing is are not enough good, and we do that hearing preservation in children, which is very challenging, it's some part of them, but the group of adults with postlingual hearing loss, with progressive hearing loss, it increased and increased. So there is the, that group all, quite soon will be really the majority in the centers who are real in the game. So we should know how to do it. And the issue which was at the beginning, there was standard electrode. It was standard metal electrode who, which was inserted to 20 millimeters. And this was the group with very good hearing preservation. It was not electrode which was dedicated for that. Today, you have plenty of different solution, even up to 0 0.25, 0 0.3. So that electrodes are on the one hand, much more flexible. On the second hand, they are better because of the volume of the electrode uh, makes the structure preservation much more possible. So this is something what has changed. You can see how it look in the screen. And today we have plenty solution. I understand that some centers who perform 10 implants per year, 20 implants per year, especially from other somehow custom area, it's not easy to have in the stock all different electrodes but we have many solutions and quite often we decide sometimes even of the operation theater when you look for the condition, which electrode to use, but it's good that we have that solution. So we could offer the patient a lot of solution which could be adjusted to the hearing. Uh, when we look for the surgical strategy, I only focus on some points uh, which are important. Uh, earlier, quite often we didn't analyze as meticulously the CT scans. Today we have such very nice tools like Autoplan. I honestly don't use it in each case, but in the plenty of cases when there is high risk, what does it mean? We have 62 years old lady who has progressive hearing loss, very good hearing in low frequencies, some history of inflammation, and we need to check how is the mastoid? Is it white 
on the screen or is a little bit back, which means that it could be not so much drilling, so not so much noise exposure. We need to analyze how is the cochlea. If we need to drill more or we could have ossification. So it could happen that the conditions will be a little bit worse and more challenging. So we need to really evaluate that. So it's not only audiogram. We look for speech understanding. Quite often we have cases that hearing is not very bad, but when we send such patient for the hearing care trial, it occurred that in best aided condition, on, I don't know, 80 or 90 dB uh, stimulation, there is only 5% speech understanding. It, it happens sometimes. So this is the all other all factors which we need to obtain, how to go, which, which solution is it's, it should be performed and how we could support. So this is very important to have that. And it, it's, we're happy that we have that. Cut is typical, antromastoidotomy, that what is, we do it in all case, uh, is important to understand and to change is to have it a little bit limited, so not too much drilling, especially in elderly population when we really could make quite a lot of noise exposure. Uh, when we see, when we go to the round window area, this is very nice situation, uh, which is uh, there and really uh, not, all, not always we can achieve that approach to the round window, which is there. We must preserve the structure. It could be the bony breeze. Sometimes you could take it out, but it's important to have short press of the incus, everything on place. We should not touch it with the diamond bar. We should not to make any damage. And if we have such situation, it's very nice and very big chance to have nice approach because we would like to put the electrode on the way, which will make as less trauma as possible. And quite often, we see that that round window is, for example, overgrowth. There is some tissue, there is some bone, and we need to enlarge that. So that's why we need to take bone overhang, especially if you would like to put the electrode, which we, for example, measure that the round window is preserved, but it's only 0.6 millimeter. And then on the one hand, I would like to thank Adam Balkowiak, I've seen his on the, also today with us, like our Professor Lawrence, that they claim that if we do the electrode through the very narrow round window, we could achieve hearing preservation, but after that, we could make some damage for the contact. So we need to always look for that, what will happen later also for uh, audiologists, for the team who are doing the fitting, not only from surgical point of view, but that cooperation is extremely important. And that natural way is really very much, de very much demanded from the cooperation. Uh, very important is also function and this is somehow of crucial level because earlier it was the puncture which was uh, somehow a little bit offensive. It was a big opening. We try to make small opening. And then I'm sure that Professor Rajan will talk about that, that all uh, idea and talks about the pressure in the cochlea. If we make a little bit larger opening, we check if there is a fluid exit, if there is, you know, Perlin. If it goes, we know that if we put the electrode, that perlin will go out. Because if we put the insertion too fast, uh, we don't do you know one mm minute per millimeter. We do it faster. But if you do insertion too fast, it means that you could make too much pressure, which could uh, start the apoptotic pathway. So it's important also to have that, but to seal the electrode in the end. To seal that because then it could be inflammation which also could affect the hearing and could make the hearing loss. Another important information, which is, which is quite really, really important, except insertion, which we could talk a lot about insertion. There is very, there is step, which is really sometimes underestimated. When we seal the electrode, seal it on that way, that the electrode will be not connected with the ossicular chain, because we could have conductive components. Sometimes we would like to see, we put the fascia with fibrin glue, and then we could have conductive components. So it's really, and that sometimes is also very difficult for the surgery. And, and quite often during temporal bone lab, I see that it's underestimated by some surgeons. So really we need to keep the electrode. After we make insertion, not to take out the forceps, to keep it, to do everything quite smoothly, not to make later special movements or some forces which could make some damage in the cochlea. So this is from the surgical steps. I would like to go back to the, the conference. As I remember, it was, it was in Miami, the hearing preservation workshop where there was discussion about approach. And there was big tendency for making cochlea ostomy. 
No, we were always round window people somehow, uh, but it was discussion about cochlostomy. And from that situation, it was mainly trend in US at the beginning and some centers in Europe. And you see in 2006, only 16% of surgeons reported that sometimes perform round window. This is publication from Madunka and Bushman who are now in the top of American Cochlear Implant Alliance. So, but they also change the approach. They also do as much as possible round window because at first, cochlostomy is easier, cochlostomy is faster, and cochlostomy is more safe from the uh, injury of the facial nerve point of view. And insurance company also it will be forced to be more safe. Today we are more brave and we do the really facial research properly. This is not a big issue, but sometimes it happens and I show you results which were not published when we have facial nerve position a little bit abnormal and when we did cochlostomy, how are the results? So it, it was the trend today, Sometimes people talk about that, sometimes they don't talk about. Majority is the through round window. So really cochlostomy is uh, only, and uh, maybe sometimes it's misinterpretation. It's a round window extended approach. It's different than cochlostomy. Sometimes we have ossification of the, of the round window um, area, round window niche, and we need to enlarge the area to go to the cochlea. And we drill and we see that there is very thin, thin area, this is not big round window or there is no round window. We have patient with resilient hearing and we need to drill it out. So it's, of course, somehow we are like cochlostomy, we need to go a little bit superior. Uh, we don't, we cannot use the suction. We use the hook superior, for example, sometimes, and we take smoothly, meticulously, part by part bone. But we need to remember that we need to, uh, to have the opening when the electrode will go on. And it sometimes happens. It, it, it's like cochlostomy, then we have no chance. And of course, the other solution when there is not normal position of the fashion. Going back to different results, which I would like to share with you. This is somehow first publication from 2001, uh, when there was preservation of residual hearing in children as postlinguali, definite adults. So not it was postlinguali. After it was initial study, you can see how was the hearing, how it went, and that our let's say trademark group. There is the group like here with the very good hearing in low frequencies. It was really something which was almost not accepted. The patient was implanted in 2002. Publication with the first children group was much more difficult because in review, it was over two years. The first child was in 2004 that we had solution of the implantation. So insertion of electrode, preservation of the hearing and no acoustic amplification. And it went okay. Other solutions which were, uh, today this is, you have, have Sonet EAS, so it's very nice, very easy, but earlier there was the speech processor and additional hearing aid. So that person was like, you know, like on the Christmas tree, you had the processor, hearing aid, big solution. Sometimes, you know, it was, you know, waiting time and they said, oh, come on, I don't want to have a lot of toys on my head. So maybe we do something else. Today we have nice, we can do uh, two in one, but earlier it was not as easy. So also there was acceptance of the patients to have such solution. And I would like to focus because we, I will not talk about that one hour, but that I think so is key issue today. When you remember and when you go to the conference, there is a lot of serious discussion to make nine millimeters, maybe 12 millimeters, maybe 14 millimeters. And then uh, we talked that at least 20 millimeters, but also after that we checked how it will be with progressive hearing loss, because the hearing is progressive. It, 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 it goes down, down, down in years. And what to do if it's like that? What to do if we have such patient? And in 2011, 12, more or less, there was the first publication in ACTA about a traumatic round window deep insertion, deep insertion. So we wanted to use it really deep, like 28 millimeters. And it was analysis of implanted ear and contralateral ear. And in contralateral ear, that hearing also decreased more. Uh, that was presented in the hearing preservation meeting in pair. that when we analyzed the hearing 10 years, from 10 years perspective, the progressiveness of the hearing loss in the control, in the control ear, in this contralateral ear was faster than the implanted ear. So we need to know what will be today and what will be later. It's something what always I try to explain to the patient during the meeting that I would like to give you a solution for all your life. And today we have such situation. In five years, we could have other situation. Also, it's important that we need to have the patient with the hearing preservation at least on one year follow-up. 
we need to see them unless there is no dosification. So if there is dosification, we do it as fast as possible. But if you have patient with the progressive hearing loss, we need to see how is the rate, how it fast it goes to predict what we will do and how will be the, the hearing later, not to go to shallow. That concept presented was announced first in USPCI in Warsaw in 2009. After that, it was a little bit corrected in 2014. There are different groups and there is some objectives in, in which hearing we would like to go with how deep insertion. So no more than 20 is in a really PDTNS, very challenging cases, very rare cases in the really complicated and meticulously counseling when the patient they needed is very small group from all package of the group which we have. PDTEC, which is quite big, but not a very large group, and PDTEAS. So in PDTEAS, which is group, I think this is a key trademark for medal. That group is the most popular. Uh, we try to go for 25 up to 28 millimeters, and our decision consists of hearing, pure tone audiometry, analysis of the history, absolutely analysis of speech understanding results with the hearing aids, and also anatomical condition. And honestly, I'm quite unpopular. Some patients, they, they don't like me. I'm on the position that such patient without hearing aid trial and wearing hearing aids should not be implanted. Of course, sometimes the people say that they don't want to have hearing aids. They want to have implants because it's cheaper, you know, because, you know, they, they would like to have cheaper solution because it's reimbursed. It depends on the country. From my point of view, it, this is, should be, it should be changed. So when you look for that and the consensus of the practice guide from the hearing, the formula, which was really worked on that many years to have the hearing preservation uh, classification with all the hearing group, we tried to adjust and assess the results, what was supposed to be for after that, and some results I will show you. First group was first, it's quite old with electrodes with 10 years observation with adults. And you can see there is a group with metal, some of was with the SRA, so six to two electrode, one cochlostom. You can see that 10 years observation in the group of 20, 45 years plus minus 13. You can see in the old group how it behaves. And that results are, are really good. You can see how it's after 10 years. There is progressiveness if implanted here in the contralateral year. You can see results unaided, aided, and after implants. So you can see how it's influenced, even with hearing case. It's really, really tremendous amplification. No chance to achieve with the hearing case. Children group, they are better for hearing preservation point of view. They, you can see that seven group is small group. It's decreased in the years, but you can see that the, after 10 years, speech understanding is better than after five years. So even it is decreasing the hearing, there is better speech understanding, but there's one condition. They must come at least for one year for the fitting. Some one, they don't come, they disappeared and they come after four or five years, they come to have, you know, exchange of the speech processor and they are three years without that. So in speech understanding in noise, we could achieve better after 10 years. And the, decrease of the hearing loss in contralaterality is slower than in, in adults. This is the group special I would like to show. This is children group of the 10 years old. Uh, is a facial nerve pollution. So it was difficult condition. And in that case, in 14%, we didn't risk. We make, we make cochlostomy. You can see that results. It was decrease of the hearing loss. Also hearing was preserved. That is, that could be worse. Why? Because if we do cochlostomy, we could have ossification, we could have bone dust, we could have some issues with a normal, not normal position and more risk of sleep, of uh, teeth fold over to go to scala vestibule. A very special group, seven years observation, you can see PDT ENS, very good hearing, decrease in that, but you can see how our results in terms of the hearing preservation formula. So if you do this 20 millimeter insertion there, 19, it's okay. In such group is a very important issue. If you do the insertion, you need to stop at the first resistance, not to go over. Because if you make some forces, it would be difficult. You can see how our results were unaided with hearing case. And the decision in that group, in that boy, was because it was progressiveness of the hearing loss. We didn't want to wait. And also the serial number of pediatric cases, you can see that it's really wonderful group and with wonderful uh, uh, results and also you can see the hearing aids and the implants. With metal flex 28 is one of the studies from the 2012, 2017. And you can see in, the, in that group in EAS, we want to, to make full insertion. You can see either the first, first studies in six patients. You can see results before and with flex 28 and with other electrodes. What it means, flex soft, for example. So we make deeper. 
We wanted to make full insertion because we see that there was absolutely no benefits from the hearing case. We wanted to make a full insertion and we were aware that could be some risk. So you can see that they lost a little bit hearing, but it was, it was not good. And also in such group, there are some other factors. When you have other factors, please not hesitate to go deeper because it will, it will not as, uh, uh, amplify with acoustic component. If you don't amplify with acoustic component of the speech processor, go and uh, to make full insertion and you have the here full insertion. If we give PDTE as case, so it's meaningless from the acoustic amplification point of view, even if we feel some resistance, even if you have overgrowth of the round window, we do full insertion of Flex 28 and other electrodes. And you can see that sometimes it could be loss of hearing, but we can have loss of hearing from pure tonal audiometry point of view, but you can see how our results without hearing case unaided nothing. Like the beach, like, you know, it's a little flat rate. With operative hearing aids, something was meaningless from the, you know, abilities. With implants and bilateral, that results were far better. So in that case, we go full insertion, even that black dots are there. This is really, really important. We also compared in the one group to make shallower or deeper insertion in PDTEC case. The 12 patients were with flex 20 and 11 were with flex 24. Flex 20 is less flexible. This is shorter electrode, the same number of contacts, this is more stiff. So flex 24 is more elastic. And you can see that this is the group where um, comparable from a statistical point of view, you see how it looks in activation six months, 12 months and 24 months, but maybe go, we go there. This is more clear comparison, deeper where better. So that's why in that case, always we probably want to make a little bit deeper insertion. And when we feel some resistance, we could, for example, stay with one contact at the entrance and sometimes we turn off that contact. Also, there are some other important factors. We really put the steroids. This is standard. We don't use it without steroids. All our goal is clear. We do it before implantation. We do it during implantation. This is dexamethasone solution adjusted to the bone mass. And after that, we also give it when the patient is discharged. There are the publication uh, with uh, making it more steroids, less steroids, you can go into that. So we, we analyze it very much. So the key factors to achieve that, what is made together with metal electrodes, you know, from, from eight of 90s, it's over 20 years, almost 25 years, there are electrodes. There is important for the counseling to meet real expectation from the patient because sometimes quite often that expectation are too high. They have no hearing, they want to have implants, no fitting and everything nice after one month. Sometimes it's impossible, so we need to do this. There is surgical skills because you could have really delicate electrodes, but if you will have, you know, tough surgery, too strong, too fast, too brutal, I would like to say too much drilling, what happens, you will never achieve hearing preservation. And very important is rehabilitation, is fitting, and to have really nice specialists who really will take care of the patient after that and report that. And also the, we, we talk about that, what is possible and learn each other. So this is the perspective of that, what we could achieve together as an implant to present a very good solution for the people in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. And I open for the questions after, after the uh, Professor Ryan presentation. Thank you, Professor Skarsinski, for your fascinating uh, presentation and showing the, such a outstanding data. It's, uh, it's uh, very great to see that patients even add for, to various hearing perioperatively, even 10 years after surgery, they maintain the hearing. If anybody has uh, questions, please drop them in the chat room and we will go over them. But right now, uh, we will go over to Professor Rajan. Uh, Professor Rajan, you can start whenever you are ready. All right, great. Thank you, Marek. Uh, thank you to everyone for being here. It's great to be here. Uh, it's great also to be able to have a great introduction talk by Professor Skalzinski that sort of lays down the pitch. So I'll uh, jump straight into it. Um, let me get this clear, there we go. So. All right, so uh, what you heard by Professor Skazinski is, you know, that uh, 
you can achieve hearing and structure preservation and you can use the, the result, the preservation of the residual hearing. You can combine that with the electric signal of the cochlear implant to achieve much better hearing benefits for the patient. That's our goal. So what I want to shift gears and talk about, you know, the rationale and how we can uh, improve our cochlear implant surgery as surgeons to get there. Professor, I'm glad Professor Stavinsky only touched quite a few bits so I can really hook on to that. I'll first acknowledge uh, the great team which allowed us to find, do a lot of work in this area, the, my group in Perth, and also now the group here in Lucerne, which is uh, doing great work. And without all this work, you see is wouldn't have been possible. Well, the introduction was already made. So it's quite clear now that, you know, we are able to put in long electrodes into the cochlea and also preserve hearing at the same time. We published this a while ago, 2012, actually, that, you know, we all encounter a surgeon, we have to re-implant patients, be it adults, be it uh, children. So we looked at what happens if we, to residual hearing and if you have to re-implant them. And the good news was that you can actually preserve residual hearing despite having to re-implant the patient, re-implant the same ear. So this is just an example on your right. The patient who had a flex ES electrode had a trauma and had to do re-implant and we used a longer electrode at the time. And so we replaced the flex 24 with the flex 28. And interestingly, we were able to preserve the hearing despite that. So one thing, re-implanting with a longer electrode, which worked fine, but at the same time, preserving the residual hearing. So we know we can do that nowadays. And the other thing is, we, did, we also did a multi-center study. Uh, Silke Helvig from Frankfurt did the great work and combined all the data and showed that even with long electrodes, you can re you can reimplant them and preserve hearing, you know. And that I think shows you, together with what Professor Skazinski said, that it's worthwhile doing because we want to keep this combination, the strong combination of electric and acoustic signal for the patient, you know, even if you have to reimplant them. So, you know, in my career, I've seen how the concept of cochlear implantation has evolved. You know, first, you know, it's, it was all about restoring hearing in these deaf patients. But then we realized, you know, patients with partial deafness, as Professor Stavzinski beautifully showed, that they don't really have a whole benefit of the whole spectrum of hearing. So they benefit of preserving the hearing and combining it with the electric signal. And then we realized, well, you know, hearing preservation, you know, that's one thing because we are actually dealing with the whole inner ear. So the concept of structure preservation came on later. So evolved out of hearing preservation. Why? Think of the children, the babies we are performing bilateral implants for. You know, we want to make sure that not only the hearing, you know, the substrate in the inner ear is preserved in the cochlea, but also that the vestibular system is preserved, right? But always think inner ear, you know, so that's structure preservation. The other thing you should also keep in mind with structure preservation is it's not only the inner ear, but also the, the middle ear, the ossicles. We want to preserve the ossicles as well. And that Professor Skazinski mentioned that. That's a, one little detail. In your, in your surgical technique, keeping that in mind. So I want to show you how to achieve, how to get good at, how we can get better at, you know, doing soft surgery to structure preserve the inner ear and the middle ear. So initially when we started, we didn't really know where to go. You know, it's quite hipwire and, you know, there's a lot of theories, but over the last 15 years, I think we've learned quite a lot thanks to the research of various groups and I want to take you through that and so the key the key points and I think very fundamental for the understanding of what we are doing to the inner ear when we're doing cochlear implantation is this two hit concept of inner ear injury during cochlear implantation and first 
is the trauma we do as surgeons during CI surgery. Second is what happens in the inner ear after you have put in the electrode. And so keep these two hits in mind because what we're trying to do is to really attenuate the effects of these two hits. So the key elements, and Dr. Olvi addressed that, you know, obviously there are patient factors. I think important are genetics, the age. We know children have much better hearing preservation than adults. The anatomy plays a big role, you know, the cochlear duct length, the diameter of the cochlear duct, you know, what's the amount of residual hearing? I won't talk about that. I want to focus purely on these two hits during the cochlear implantation and what happens afterwards. And there, the key elements are what we can do as surgeons, as physicians, hearing health professionals. We can improve our surgical technique. So I'll talk about insertion mechanics. We can also talk about what we, how we can pharmacologically protect the inner ear. And then we can also briefly touch, you know, what array we should use to be atraumatic. And obviously what, what tools are evolving so that we can monitor our atraumatic approach during the cochlear implant surgery. So based on the literature and the evidence and our data, we've sort of created the structure preservation surgery checklist. And um, I invite you to have a look at it and I'll go through these different steps uh, as, as we go through my talk. So the first thing is, I want to talk about insertion mechanics. That's tackling the first hit, remember? when we do the actual surgery. And basically what we're trying to do during the surgery is we want to create a big wide posterior tympanotomy. We want to open the round window membrane underwater in the steroid lake or whatever. We want to do a slow insertion. I'll talk about this step. We won't, if you want to be a traumatic, we won't insert an electrode against any resistance we encounter. And obviously at the end, we also, we have to fix the array as, you know, after we've done a great job of inserting, inserting it, it's not finished yet. We have to also do the toll so that it doesn't drop or that we don't do any damage after the surgery. So how to open the round window membrane and Mittman and Ingo taught it in, in Berlin at the time, did some great experiments. And what this basically shows you is that the pressure changes inside the cochlea. This has been done in, in, in vitro artificial cochlear models, uh, you know, where you insert the electrode, you measure what the pressure changes in the inner ear. And you can say whatever we do, they, it always causes a lot of pressure change and, and quick pressure change. And this quick pressure change is something the inner ear doesn't like or the hair cells don't like. So how can we attenuate that? And there's a quite simple technique of doing that. And that's putting in, inserting the electrode through fluid, basically putting the middle ear underwater, or at least the round window niche under water. And this is a nice experiment that clearly shows you that if you insert or put in a cannula or an electrode into the inner ear, if it's dry, you have this huge pressure change. While if you, put it through fluid, you, all, you basically eliminate this pressure change, which is damaging for the inner ear. We had the first, second question initially in the survey, you know, what's the role of insertion speed? And I love the answers because they all showed me that people are thinking in the right way. That is, put it in, put in the electrode as slow as possible in order to avoid the intracochlear pressure change. And it's great to see that, you know, that concept is, is, is really becoming broadly, aware, you know, broadly distributed. And this is just to show you with different, in, with different, uh, you know, insertion speeds, how the, the insertion force and the pressures rise the, fa the faster you insert. We did some experiments in a cohort of experienced cochlear implant surgeons and measured their pressure changes over time. You have the axis, the time here, and you can see the pressure changes. And what you can see is, you know, you look at the blue and the red 
surgeon, they, they do it manually and they were doing it sort of freehand. And the difference to the surgeon in black, his curve hardly has any pressure changes is because he, he put his, he rested his hand, his insertion hand on something. So, and just by doing that, he was able to attenuate those pressure changes. So that's something to take home as well. And obviously, we can also, you know, obviously we are man, we are limited, we humans, you know, we always have tremor no matter how good we are. And this is just to show you what happens if we let a, an automated insertion or robotic insertion occur and you can see that the pressure changes have decreased by around 20 fold. So I think that's probably the way of the future. You know, there's, there's a lot of research into insertion devices and tools, and I think they'll help us to even improve, further improve the insertion technique. The impact of array design is important. The important thing you have to take home is that the smaller the volume of the array you put into the cochlea, the better it is for the cochlea. And this is just to show you, you know, the different types of uh, arrays and, you know, they're larger and as they get smaller and more floppier. So top right is a, uh, top left is a perimodular and top uh, low, low right is a, a small, you know, lateral wall electrode. And you can see the pressure changes with the same speed, how it changes just with the array design. So keep that in mind. The array design, the volume of the array plays a big role in how uh, the pressure changes inside the cochlea. Another effect we often underestimated was, you know, we are very happy. You did a beautiful posterior tympanotomy. You did a really slow insertion. You did everything right, you know, everything underwater. And then at the end, you seal off the round window membrane. And what this graph shows you, or this experiment shows you that what happens is with the pressure transduction, if you, if you seal the round window, electrode and you move the lead in the mastoid after you've done the insertion. So you now know that the insertion doesn't stop after the electrode's in, it stops once you've finished touching the whole implant. And that means also putting in the conductor link or the electrode lead into the mastoid bowl. Because even that, and that's what the next slide shows, on your left hand, you, you see this movement of the pressure changes, which gets transducted as you move the electrode lead in the mastoid bowl. So keep that in mind. And this, what happened on the right is what happens if you fix the electrode with one hand and then move the electrode lead in the bowl. See how it attenuates this whole effect of the pressure press transduction into the inner ear. And this is again, the same thing with, with the patching and with the, um, of the round window membrane. And if you don't fix it, and if you fixate the electrode that you attenuate these pressure changes after you've done everything. So just the insertion, the implantation doesn't stop with the insertion, it stops when you've touched the electrode for the last time after you've inserted the electrode lead into the mastoid bowl. So that this last point, and this is very important just to conceptualize, Piotr already addressed that, you know, how can we attenuate, how can we counterpunch or counteract the two hits? And we can, we can actually use pharmacologic in-ear protection to counterpunch those two hits. The first hit, the surgical hit, as well as the second hit, all those inflammatory processes that occur, we know occur after cochlear implantation. So, and the simplest drug or tool we have available are the, the steroids. And we use the steroids intravenously, you know, at induction. Obviously that's part of the anesthetic protocol. We also use topical steroids uh, before, uh, just after intubation of the patient. And 
At the end of the surgery, we also instill a steroids into the mastoid bowl in order to provide a long-term effect for the second hit so that in the days and weeks to come after implantation, there's this protective effect that gets released through the steroid. And this is just to show you that the steroids not only work as hair cell protectors, but they actually, in fact, also work. If you look at the lower, it's the control where you didn't use steroids. And this is a, this, uh, the spiral ganglia in the control and in the steroid group. And you can see that the steroids also preserve the spire, so the spire ganglia. So they also preserve the neural structures. And we were able to show in a, uh, in a presentation or in a, in a project a while ago that with the steroids, even with left corner audiograms, you're able to improve the hearing preservation in these patients with the left corner uh, audiogram. So how can we further improve our surgical technique? And that's where the intraoperative monitoring of hearing comes in. We have now all the major you know, implant brands offer the intraoperative hearing monitoring. And I think I would strongly recommend you that you familiarize with those techniques because they are evolving and they allow us to really see how good we are during surgery and how we can improve our surgery our hearing preservation during that surgery. And this is just an example using the, uh, the cochlear microphonics based system from, from Medell. And this is a uh, teenager with partial deafness. You see the audiogram on the left. And you can see how we can measure the cochlear microphonics as we insert up to 28 millimeters. And the great thing, this is instantaneous feedback telling you, yes, you've done a good job. And the nice thing is, you can measure this after surgery, during the whole follow-up. You can constantly measure and see what happens, you know, in the cochlear, basically, uh, through this cochlear microphonic. So it's a great tool to uh, to see and monitor. Your, it's a quality control tool, essentially. This is just to show you post-op what it looked like after implantation. So the take-home messages, or the take into surgery messages, basically. You know, uh, just be aware, try and conceptualize this, this, this two hit concept of in ear surgery during cochlear implantation. The first hit is what we do as surgeons during the surgery, the think insertion mechanic. The second hit are all these processes that occur, you know, after, after um, surgery, all those inflammatory processes. And uh, so avoid the intracochlear pressure changes while, while opening the run window, while inserting the electrode, even after electrode array insertion. Keep that in mind. For us, that was a big learning point. You know, we didn't realize that, what we're doing, what happens with the pressure, you know, in that state. How to open the run window membrane. Open the run window membrane underwater to attenuate the pressure change. Make a big opening in the run window membrane as Professor Skazinski all dimension. How to insert the alert array? Use at least one point support. So rest your, make sure that your hand rests somewhere so you can attenuate those little pressure changes. Insert a moisture array, insert underwater, and you stop at resistance. And obviously you always do a slow insertion. And uh, I invite you to consider pharmacologic in ear protection both topically and systemic, because the, the steroids are possibly the only way at the moment we have to really giving a positive counteraction to the, the two hits we, we initiate with cochlear implantation. And uh, I think uh, this, uh, there's a lot to say be said, but I think key, structure preservation of the inner ear is, is the key to a lot of developments we'll see and are seeing in cochlear implantation. So it's also about not only preserving the acoustic function of the patient, keep that in mind, but also the vestibular function. So think of patients we're doing bilateral implants. You know, we want to preserve the vestibular system in, in these situations. So I want to thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Professor Rajan, for for great talk. Uh, uh, I think we have to move on. Uh, we have uh, still four more minutes. So we will still have time for a few questions. But before that, I would like to ask everybody, we would like to follow our tradition. And I would like everybody to raise the cap or uh, just uh, give a smile. And on three, we're going to take a picture. So please, everybody, turn on the camera. And we're going to take a picture on three. Cheers. OK, very good. So we still have time for a few more few more questions. Uh, we received one question from Rita, and this question is coming to to Professor Rajan. Question is that uh, if you always maintain the insertion uh, two minutes ir independently of the length of the array. Yeah. Well. It's a good, good question, and I, I see you've been thinking about it. <laughs> this is great. No, the, I think it's the average. I think it's the type, the way, the speed. You know, the two minutes is just a thumb of rule, a rule of thumb, right? So I think it's about doing the insertion slowly, you know, and in, a, in a, as constant fashion as you can to avoid these pressure changes. Obviously, that's where our limitations, as you know, our manual limitations come in, and and I think um, that's where the insertion tools that are being developed will, uh, you know, will provide uh, quite a good uh, benefit. Thank you very much. There is another question for uh, Professor Rajan uh, from Michael Pockel. Uh, you mentioned assisting insertion devices which are under development from certain groups, but what would you, what would be your recommendation for pure manual insertion tools to use for best hearing and structure preservation outcomes. What do you use? Well, I, I use the freehand technique. Uh, I don't use, I just use a simple, you know, the simple claw and the freehand technique. And um, because that, that for me, I get the best haptic feedback because I don't want, as, as I told you earlier, I don't want to insert against any resistance, especially if it's in a partial deafness case or so. I want mm -hmm. to feel that. So, and for me, it's, I think it's something very individual, uh, you know, the, the, each surgeon figures that out. But for me, I just use freehand. I make sure I rest my hand and then use just a simple flow. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I have one more question for Professor Skarsinski. Uh, Professor Skarsinski, can uh, progressive hearing loss be associated with surgical approach? No, the progressive, the, there are some risk factors which could make that the progressive hearing loss will be after insertion. The first, which I many times underline, there is cochlostomy when we do the drilling, when there a little bit bony dust will go and we go through the tissue, which is quite natural. So then we get the tissue overgrowth with this very fantastic study from the Hauser Institute when they analyze how is the situation in post-mortem studies. So they took the temporal bones from the people who after die, they analyzed that and they obtained that then the bones were out window extended or cochleostomy. So the tissue growth over electrode was 10 times more then, you know, with the round window. Mm -hmm. So it's really important. Second risk factor is that we, when we have round window and we need to really drill, you know, we need to take the hook, the, to take the tissue, to take the bone, because otherwise we'll not put the electrode. It's also the factor because we could make some trauma with the needle or with the hook when we take out the tissue or the drill. And always there could some bone dust could go into the scala tympani. Of course, it could reflect in that location, but there is a really risk factor. Another issue, there are people with diabetes. With diabetes, I also observe that that progressiveness is faster. So this is also a little bit of risk group. And the patient after the uh, viral infection, for example, cytomegal virus and other diseases uh, could make influence for that really progressiveness of the hearing loss. 
Thank you, Professor. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, any of you can take either Professor Rajan or Professor Skarsinski. Uh, after, uh, let's say, we have a uh, pre-planning, so the, you decide for the right electrode, uh, how do you uh, reach full insertion and yet maintain the hearing preservation? Who would like to answer? Yes, you or me. Okay. Yota, you go ahead. I could, uh, I could tell. So when we go for the full insertion, I would like to talk like uh, Guinness perform. So we really put yeah, this ratio 0 0.25 millimeter per second is okay. So we put slow insertion and that rate, I uh, decelerate, I make slower, especially apical region. So I put it and I retry to avoid from making special friction movements when the end of the insertion. So I put the suction more over 0 0.8. I put it on the promontory. So the electrode did not you know, elevate a little bit, and I push smoothly the electrode on the posterior wall. It uh, makes that there is no special extra forces which could make, which you go through the modulus. And you make slow, 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 especially even, even there, one minute, really one minute for a millimeter would be okay. And then you put this there. And in terms of the full insertion, if I have really good hearing, Sometimes I could stop. I could stop really and I could make that last channel. I, I would avoid to make the full insertion in some cases. And when I do 28, it's okay. I like recently to make 26, especially in patients with some after sudden deafness, for example, when we could have some issue in the apical turn. It's always, uh, always Arthur Lawrence and Adam, they told me, please go as high as possible because it really matters. And I see that in the results that each millimeter really matters. And I always like that it's worth to fight for that each millimeter. So to go deeper, but sometimes that it could be really blocked. It could be some ossification, it could be some spikes and that I don't want to go and better. And then I could take 26, but then uh, to make that really full insertion. And when we finish that, really to keep the electrode, but at the end, uh, Guinness presented that, that, that really sealing period, sealing moment is really important. And I seal it properly, smoothly and slowly, not to make even, I make almost full insertion or full, to make that really changes, which could make some trauma after that. It's very nice visible in electrocochleography study when we make electrocochleography that that moment is important. Yeah, I can, I can just add if I can to that, uh, I, you know, the good thing is about, and several groups have published that and also our work that just by doing a slow insertion, you the rate of complete insertion goes up. So I know of units who are doing quite quick insertions and they switched to slow insertion. And just by doing that, their complete insertion rate went up, right? So I think that's a very important aspect. Just by doing it slowly, you're pro very likely to increase your complete insertion rate of the electrode and all the things that Piotr mentioned it's really important to to minimize and and also I think you have to give that things time because what you're doing think about what you're doing you are with the electrode you're inserting a, a mass into a confined fluid filled space filled with water so in order to minimize pressure that perilink has to go somewhere otherwise you increase the pressure change so that's why a big round window opening is necessary. So you know the perilymph can egress to neutralize. And that mm -hmm. takes time. So the more time you give it to neutralize the pressure, the better. You know, so that's a, that's the aspect. And obviously we know this from hydrodynamics. I mean, uh, we, we work with the hydrodynamics department. And if you if you insert the electrode very quickly, you know, fluid is not compressible. So Suddenly, the fluid itself acts like a wall when you do it too quickly. So, and that's also causes a big pressure change. So, I think you know these are all these factors, you know, you know, which have an effect on on the insertion depth. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rajan, Professor Skarsinski, uh, for your ex expertise. I think uh, we are already over. And for everybody, please, if you have questions, you still can drop them in a chat and uh, we can answer them. I, I can contact the surgeons and they, they can uh, help to answer the questions, uh, hopefully. So 
please uh, do it if you have questions but we will have to finish i would like to thank to professor skarsinski and professor uh, rajan and uh, uh, I would like to also uh, make a value of the upcoming expert online event, uh, which is going to be in two weeks on music rehabilitation, supporting adults remotely. And please remember that all the experts online meet meetings, including this one, is uh, available and you can freely uh, look on it later on. It's available on the Medal Academy, academy.medal.com and you can view it anytime. We're looking forward to you uh, next time. Thank you and bye-bye everybody.